Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I hope this stuff isn't too loud. Hello, pretty squirrel. M. Bailey, 430. Hello. Um, I have my different glasses on today, so hopefully I don't have to keep doing this. I can kind of read you. I think I can see you. Can you guys hear me okay? I need to clean these glasses though. Mm. Now I can't see you at all. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hello, yes, you can hear me f just fine. That's perfect. Um, because these, um, uh, I've got some um, induction burners that I use in the shop here because I don't have a stove in here. Um, they can be a little loud. So let me just make sure that I don't have all kinds of spots all over my glasses. So I'm going to try to dye some stuff with you this morning. So I figured you might as well join along if you're interested, those of you who are interested. So um, I've done some kind of preparation work um, and this is what we're going to do. Hold on. So the plan is to take things that look like this and turn them into things that look like this. So, oh. I really love to over dye um, fawns and, um, and browns. These are both considered fawn. This is a light fawn and this is kind of a medium fawn. Um, I really like to over dye these because you get a, a depth of color that you can't typically get with, um, with a white or an A crew. So what I did to start, and I might have to move you around a little bit, is uh, the first thing I did was you have to take your skein from this um, and you have to open it up like this and you can see that there's ties on there right now um, you would have to undo those ties and then retie I use butterfly ties do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say butterfly ties you do you do okay I hear you heating up my dye pots so um, because of the method that I'm using and because I don't want my yarn to um, end up all tangled in the dye pot you have to tie it in a way so that the loops kind of stay together so I can't leave it like this well I could but that wouldn't be a very good idea because as you can see there's a tie right here and if I okay so if I left it just like this, um, it's going to be like tie-dye. I don't want that. So I'm going to undo that and put some butterfly ties in here. And then I see that, um, Melanie, you like to use zip ties. I actually like to use these. These are plastic shower curtain hooks that have a nice closure on them. Uh, can you see that? Um, they don't get hot. Um, you just... I should do that on camera. Ooh. So you just open them up, put your skein inside and do that. And now all you need to do is find this in your dye, dye bath and you have your skein and it's in the, in the right order. Yeah, so these are really cheap. I, actually, I don't get them at the dollar store, I actually get them at Walmart, but they're only $2 and you get, get 10 or 12, probably a dozen of them. So I keep lots of these around because I use them all the time, they're great. Um, so what I have done is uh, I started earlier this morning, I started, I put the butterfly ties on my yarn and I put the um, shower curtain hooks and then I've been soaking my yarn in, pre-soaking the yarn in, in just, uh, in just water. So, um, so a pack of fiber takes a long time to pre-soak, a pack of yarn takes a long time to pre-soak, I don't know if you can see this yet. Um, and it could could do with a little bit longer. Um, the more the more you pre-soak your yarn within reason, the more uh, consistent your dye strike's going to be. Um, you could, you know, one technique is to put dry yarn into a dye bath. That's a technique. It's gonna the result is gonna be a little bit different than if you were to pre-soak your yarns. Um, but the technique I'm going for today requires pre-soaking. So here is my my medium fawn. 
that's been soaked in water. You can see these butterfly ties. We got a couple of those, and I just use um, crochet yarn, and I cut up lengths that are probably six to eight inches long. Uh, I undo the tie that was originally there. Uh, I tie each end to one of these um, pieces of, of uh, crochet yarn, and then I do the butterfly. It's kind of like a figure eight. And then I soak. And uh, this morning I've only soaked in, in kind of room temperature water. So I'm just going to take these out of here and get them ready. Where's everybody from this morning? Good morning! I'm still having my coffee. Joali. Well, Rebecca. Jendi Drew, Marina, I can't pronounce you guys' names. I can't figure out how they, where you get them from. Okay. So, I've got my skeins. Oops. Connecticut, good morning, Dartmouth. Perfect. No, I'm just going to wave at a bunch of folks. So here are my pre-soak skeins. So I've got two of each color. Uh, but just so you see, I'm gonna move you over here for a little bit. Let's hope we don't drop anything. Now, um, I don't have a stove in the studio. Uh, I am using uh, induction burners. So this is a, is a two element induction burner and I'm actually using uh, a restaurant tray in here. This is the first time I'm using this particular technique. We're going to see how it goes. The water level is lower. Um, I'm finding that with the induction burners, a big dye pot like this, it's really hard to heat it um, because of the, the height of the, the water is so high. It's really hard to get it to, to the temperature that I want. So I'm trying this. So the two burners are on. It's a little bit lower. I still have enough in there to do um, you know, a full immersion dye, um, but it just doesn't have to heat heat is high so it's actually heating up a whole lot quicker than this over here uh, that being said <laughs> I have um, thermometers in each of my dye baths uh, these are just meat thermometers these are really they're cheap pick them up at Walmart or Canadian Tire or wherever um, and I only use them for dyeing but I put them in each of the dye baths now this morning, what we're doing is we're using um, uh, we're using greener shades dye, and we're using amethyst purple. I think that's what it's called. So it's greener shades. It's not a Amazon green, uh, but it's uh, amethyst purple that we're using. So greener shades. Um, and I made up my dye solution, uh, my stock solution, uh, yesterday. And I've decided what depth of shade I want my uh, yarns to be. I've made this particular colorway a number of times, and of course I keep notes uh, whenever, I'm in, whenever I'm in the dye studio. So when I do something and I like it, I can always reproduce it. So I know exactly um, what concentration or what volume of the stock solution needs to go e into each of my dye baths based on the weight of yarn I'm going to put in there. Any questions so far? So right now my dye baths are both sitting at, this one's a little hot, I'm going to turn this down a little bit. Um, I want my dye bath to be between 180 and under 200 degrees. I don't want it to go over that. Um, and they're ready and I've already put my uh, acid in both dye baths. I use citric acid. So we'll do one at a time. How's that sound? And see how it goes. So because the um, because the dye bath is already no, I don't only use greener shades. Um, I also use Jacquard dyes, and uh, I have some of this brand as well. This is called uh, G and K Craft. I use this from time to time too. Of course, I do like greener shades. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
Jacquard's got a whole lot more variety, of course. Uh, greener shades you can get there, but you need a you need to do a, a lot more mixing, I guess. Um, and of course, I've used um, Kool Aid in the past, and of course, uh, Wilton's food dye. I like to use that as well. Uh, but with Kool Aid and Wilton's food dye, you tend not to get the um, uh, the saturation that you can get with with the you know uh, protein fiber dyes. So these are protein fiber dyes. So what I'm just doing is I'm just opening these up to make sure nothing's really stuck together. And I'm going to take one skein of the light fawn and one skein of the dark fawn and put them in each of the dye baths. So let's just give this a little stir. So as I said, I've already put the acid in here. And of course, I've got the dye in here. Um, so the dye should strike um, to the yarn pretty quickly. So let's see how it goes. I don't know how well you can see. So I find that when I use this particular technique, I like having the dye strike immediately um, because I like the look of that yarn. You get a, as opposed to um, putting the pre-soaked yarn in a cool water bath and slowly raising the temperature of the bath and adding the acid at a different time. You get a different look. I like this particular look. Oh, here, that's 206. You need to try this out. Okay, I'll take the lid off. Ooh, hot! Excuse me. There we go. So, Pull you a little bit closer. Hopefully, you can see. I don't know how well you can see. Let's see how much dye is in here. So, to begin with, there's a fair amount of color uh, in the dye bath, but that's going to exhaust actually pretty quickly, or it should. So, the temperature in the dye bath right now is about 180 degrees. I'm going to take you off here a minute. Stay with me. And I'm going to turn you around. There you go. Uh, and you can see, so the darker fawn is here and the lighter fawn is here. Do I only have solid color yarn? Do I only have solid color yarn or do I only dye solid color yarn? No, I dye multicolored yarn as well, so um, that's fine there for a second. Uh, what do you think of that? Uh, this one I call pansies. It's a different technique, of course. Uh, this is Forever in Blue Jeans. Um, this one, my... <laughs> I've got a uh, shop assistant and uh, she was experiment experimenting earlier this week because I'll be doing dye workshops uh, and this is what she came up with. She had kind of some fun with that. And then of course I've got a bunch of others as well. Yeah. So, but today we're just, we're doing kind of a solid color. That's the technique I'm doing today. Let me check my, uh, put you back over here. How are we doing? So this is still coming along. Let's see how much dye is still in the dye bath. So there's still a fair amount of dye in there. Um, and the temperature is sitting at 179. This one over here, we're just above 200 degrees. I want it to cool just a little bit. Uh, I don't want it to be quite that hot. Yeah. Now, when you're making up your uh, dye stocks, uh, you should always wear a mask. I have an N95 mask that I wear when I'm um, working with the powder. You don't need to wear a mask when the, the dye is in solution, but when you're working with the powder, the powder is very fine, so you need kind of a dust mist mask. It would be Fahrenheit. 
So you have to remember that 2, 212 Fahrenheit is uh, boiling. The water will start to boil at about 105, but you get a, get to a rolling boil at, excuse me, at uh, 205. You get a rolling boil at about 212, and uh, you can't get hotter than 212 because water turns to steam at 212, and um, you can't get that steam hotter than 212 unless you use pressure and compress it. So um, now some dyes do fine if the temperature is above 200. You know, the dye manufacturers recommend typically 180, 160 to, 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 to 200 usually, depending on the manufacturer. Um, but I have one dye in particular um, that I've used that changes if it goes above, if it goes above 200. Um, and it, I came by it um, by accident, actually. If you can get you that. Okay, that's cooling down. This one's doing fine, so come with me. Let's go show you. So, um, it was kind of an interesting experiment. Well, it was an experiment. It happened quite by accident. Um, let's see what we got here. Oops. Hold on, bear with me. So, oh, I'm going to turn you around. So hopefully you can see these three. So this is the color it was supposed to be. This one and this one. So this is just a, uh, a darker de depth of shade than this one. So this is what the dye is supposed to turn out as. And uh, it turned out this way. <laughs> and this way. You can see that. The variation in there in color um, and what happened here actually is um, it took some time to figure it out but what happened was I'm going to turn you around again what happened was that one of my dye pots um, got over 200 degrees and boiled just a little bit and the color was what the color was until it started to cool and once the, um, once the dye bath started to cool, I noticed that the yarn was changing color and it became to, began, began to lighten. Um, so what we determined actually happened was that particular dye is not stable beyond 200 degrees and it starts to degrade if it goes above that. And so the dye actually degraded and we were left with this color. I really love it actually, by the way. And if you only degrade it a little bit, you get this variation. I don't know how well you can see that, but you can see that you've got some of the, the, the color it's supposed to be, but you've also got some of this, you know, um, mango-y stuff. Do I spin my own fiber? I do spin fiber, but I spin for pleasure, not for production. Am I gonna participate in Turner, please? I'll try to do some spinning today, yeah. Let's see how we're doing here. That's still kind of hot. So I'm not using a whole lot of agitation here because I don't want to, but uh, as you can see, hopefully you can see now. Um, hold on. Um, so it's really beginning to lighten. So a lot, of the a lot of the dye has been taken up by the yarn that's in here already. Let's turn this down some because it's still a little bit too warm. It won't take too much longer for this to finish up. So, are you a spinner? Are you going to spin in turtle tur fleece? Hello! So, um, temperature is better in this dye bath, so I'm going to add the remaining two skeins again uh, light fawn and darker darker fawn kind of a medium fawn that have been pre-soaked there we go you love to spin perfect do you have a particular style of spinning that you like to do at 182 in this dye bath and 196 in this dye bath. Hello! Let's 
see how much we got here. You can see that's really lightened up. There's very not not very much color left in there. Yep. Boys are playing out there. It's been mostly merino, but I'm processing Shetland fleece right now. Okay, perfect. Now here's the. Um, can you see this one? You can see uh, there's a lot of color in this because we've just added the yarn. And um, do you spin on a drop spindle or a wheel? And what kind of wheel? Because I'm always, always interested. And are you like me? Because I've got five wheels. Because <laughs> one's not enough. Let's go take a look outside so you can see the critters out there. Hold on a sec. So this, oh, you don't want to see me. You want to see that. Sorry about that. So you can see it's coming along. So this is the lighter fawn here and then the darker fawn there. And then this one as well. The lighter fawn is here and the darker fawn is over here. I don't want to fog you up. Let's go see what's happening out here. So this is Triton out here and some of the boys. So that would be Emperor. Sorry, let me go up here and see if you can see out the window. That would be Emperor over there. And that's Trooper, it looks like Zek over there. Yeah. Um, I love that my studio has so many windows. I put lots of windows in my studio and they overlook the boys. Uh, yeah, I have a drop spindle as well. I don't use it very much as well either. I'm not very, I'm not very talented, <laughs> to be perfectly frank. I'm just gonna heat this up a little bit. Um, taking its time. So, uh, as I said, I like to use um, shower curtain hooks to put around my yarns, uh, make sure that they've got a closure that's closed. Um, it keeps your yarn from, you know, becoming a mess. And they don't get very hot. I can easily pick those up. Easily pick those up. Hello! That's 190 and this one's actually sitting at about 195. Might add a little bit more acid uh, just to try to speed up the process a little bit. So uh, now here in my studio I mostly use citric acid uh, but I've used I've used vinegar before. Yeah. So and if I if I really wanted to speed things up and I really wanted that uh, dye to strike really quickly, I would have pre-soaked my yarn in acid. Actually I do, I find citric acid does work uh, better than vinegar. I think you get the pH lower and quicker than with vinegar. Um, and you actually don't need as much. Um, but vinegar works perfectly fine. I'm just going to add a little bit more. I'm not too concerned about where where I'm putting this because most of most of the dye has already um, struck the yarn. Um, had there been no acid in this to begin with, and I applied it like that, the dye is going to strike exactly where the acid hit. It's going to strike quicker, so you might have darker spots, and that may be the look that you're going for. That's not the particular look I'm going for here. Now, the, um, again, that's where we are. Let's see what five minutes with the added uh, acid does. <clears throat> hello! Say hello, tell me where you're from. On a quest for fiber, hello. And Beck Berry, 881120. Hmm, I suspect I know your birthday, or that's an important date in your life, obviously. How are you doing over there? So 
again, I'll show you what I'm over dyeing. Over, I'll over dyeing fawn. So this is a light fawn, 100% alpaca, and this is kind of a medium fawn. It's not actually brown, it's, it's fawn. Um, I really like to over dye the fawns because you get um, just a, a depth, a, a dimension <laughs> to, the, to the yarn that, you, that I haven't been able to recreate if I was uh, dyeing uh, a white or a crew yarn. So um, I have done these before. Hello! Yo, you're moving. You're from Nunavut and you're moving to PI in August. Well, that's awesome. Let me be the first to welcome you. Why are you moving? So these are actually gonna turn out this color. So I've done these before. So this is the lighter fawn, what the lighter fawn should look like when it's dry and the darker fawn will look like this. I call this orchid. Uh, and this one is eggplant and you can see there's um I don't know how well you can see but there is beautiful variation in this color it's not a flat color uh, I can't wait to have you visit either so there is um, you can see almost pinks and the purples in there so I really like the the variegation that this technique using these colors makes. Even in this one, you can see some. Hello, Helen. How are we doing? How are we doing? How's the dye? What's coming? It's coming. So the temperature in this one is sitting at 182, and this one's sitting at 195. Let's just see how much we have left. We still have some color in here. But you can see that it is exhausting. Uh, Where is this one? Oh, there's a fair amount. So that yarn has taken up a fair amount of that dye, but there's still some to go. Um, I do find that sometimes it takes a long time for it to the dye to appear to exhaust. Um, but if you turn it off and let it sit and let it cool naturally, that that fiber will take up that dye. And all the dye will be gone once the once it cools completely. I have to say I'm not always patient enough to allow that to happen. I'm working on that. <laughs> but when I when I do let it sit till it cools completely, the dye does exhaust. Yeah. Hello, Fundy Pilot. So uh, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? So, Beck Berry, how come you're moving to PI? What's bringing you here? And I can't wait for you to visit either. Yeah, it will still be open. Do I ever speckle my yarn? Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, I would use, I wouldn't use the pot, of course, I would use the low immersion. Um, now, I bought um, restaurant warmers, uh, which I have over here. I don't know if you can see them in the background. Hold on. Right here. Restaurant warmers. Um, but I, and I've experimented with them, and, and they work great. Um, but what I'm realizing is I can use the tray actually on my induction burner and it's a nicer height for me rather than being up this high um, so I would do it in in these pans of course with um, uh, very little or no uh, bath so when I've got my mask you wouldn't of course speckle yarn unless you had a, a mask I've got a mask because you don't want to be working with that dye in powdered form unless you do have a mask it's not safe to do so So, um, but I'll show you my, I'm gonna turn around. Okay, so here's how we're coming. So you can see that there's not a lot of color left in there. I mean, there's some, some dye left. So this is the darker uh, fawn and this is the lighter fawn. And in here, <clears throat> We're getting there. It's hard to tell with the, um, with the black spoon, but we're getting there. Uh, 
um, my dyes and my stock solutions. So I make up my stock solutions. They're all labeled, of course. I make a standard stock solution. Um, so it just makes it easier for me to remember when I'm dying. Uh, and of course, I keep a book with all my notes that are hard to read, but I know mostly what they say. <laughs> and I typically uh, leave a, uh, put a sample of my dried, um, ooh, that sounds interesting, a, a sample of my dyed yarn in here so I can see what it, it looks like. So Melanie says, I'm not sure everybody else can see, see the comment here. I hope they can. Um, oops, turn you around. There we go. Um, you know, I'm gonna try that. You use resist. So, you said you use not uh, resist ties. So, do you use, do you use, would you use something like this? Because you can get, I use this to, to tie my arms. Hey, how are you? Um, uh, and it comes in various thickness or gauge. Or would you use plastic bands? But that sounds, that's one thing. I haven't tried that technique yet. I want to. I would use a, a white color yarn and uh, you would speckle it like that. That's interesting. So presumably what you would do, my, I know it's, I know it's fun. So presumably you've got your skein like this and you've got your resist, uh, I'm assuming here and here and here and wherever. Um, and you would speckle it like that. Elastic bands. Interesting. Cool. That's a great idea. I might try that. So how are we doing over here? Oh, it's almost done. Let's see, let's see, let's see. And similarly, this one's a little bit darker. Ooh, hot. <laughs> there we go. I might add a little bit more acid. Um, I'm using a pretty, uh, I'm asking to put a lot of, a lot of dye in that yarn uh, because I'm over dyeing the darker colors. So sometimes it needs a little bit of time for the fiber to take all that dye up, dye up because there is a lot of dye in there because my stock solution started out up here. Uh, that's how much stock solution I had to use in these two dye baths. Here we go. Yeah. But they will turn out, as I said, like this. That's the plan. So same, um, same color, just a different base yarn. I guess this one uh, was a darker fawn and this was a lighter fawn. <coughs> So one of the great things I love about, <clears throat> you know, dyeing the yarns is you can't really do it wrong. You know, it may not turn out the way you expect. However, um, as long as you take notes, good notes on what you did and how you did it, um, you can reproduce it, right? And assuming you've got, you know, the same dyes and the same bases and things like that. But there's so, you can vary so much and get different results. You can vary um, the type of dye that you're using. So you can use the same color, if you will, but from different manufacturers, and you're going to get different outcomes. You can vary the concentration of the, or the depth of shade you're going to use um, uh, to dye with. Uh, you can vary the yarn base, whether that's the color of the yarn base or the fiber composition of the yarn base, and you're going to get different results there. You can vary the timing uh, of of heat and the timing of acid and how much acid and all of those things will vary the outcome of your yarn. So it's cool that, you know, the possibilities are kind of endless. So somebody asked me last week, I think it was, how many different ways are there to dye yarn? And I'm like, <laughs> infinite, infinite. Let me go get, uh, I'm going to go get one more. I'm going to try to get all the, um, all the yarns in the shop that are dyed using the same dye. Uh, so we got this one. Oh, we have this one too. 
Um, we got those two already. And I got that one. Okay. I think these are all it. I'm going to put you back over here. So. Oh, I should have got the, the base yarn. Yes, I've done that too. So, um, uh, I've twisted the yarn and dyed it too. I've also done different uh, techniques where I've used a, you know, a standard dye pot and I only put some of the yarn in. So I leave some overhanging and I let the dye exhaust and then I'll um, dye other parts of the yarn. So, oh, I should have brought that base yarn that goes with this. You can't tell if you don't know what the base is. So, this one here. Uh, this. There we go. Well, these are still doing. Okay. So, these ones. So, this is the same dye, actually, as those. These are all the same. Hold on. These. I'm going to have to rescan these things. So, this one. This one. This one and this one, it's all the same dye. All the same dye, all the same concentration, all the same depth of shade, but different yarn bases. So the reason this one looks like this, uh, it started out looking like this. So uh, this isn't 100% alpaca like the others are. This is actually a blend with the uh, 70% alpaca and 30% merino and soy. Now we're using protein fiber dyes. Well, soy is not a protein fiber. Uh, and of course, merino is going to take a, is a type of sheep fiber. It's going to take up the um, dye a little bit differently. And the soy is going to struggle to take up the dye because it's not a protein fiber. It's a plant fiber. So you get this a variability in how the yarn takes up the dye. You see that? Which is a really cool technique, but this is a function of um, the content of the yarn that makes it makes the dye technique different. How are we doing? How are we doing? I'm just going to add some more acid to this. We're sitting at 175. Let's give it a little bit more acid. Hello, sheep 0421. Small ivy leaf. Hello. Add a little bit more. So, and I need to get a lid for this. I don't have a lid for this one yet. to see how it was going to work. I really quite like it. So I'll get some lights for them. There we go. Let's see how much color we have in here. It's not very much at all. Okay. That will, hey guys, that will, um, uh, the dye will likely be uh, exhausted if we allow it to cool. That's a little bit darker. You know, never trust soy. I don't trust soy. I don't trust anything that you can eat, drink, and make textiles with, because you can do all of those things with soy. It makes me kind of suspicious. But anyway, go enjoy your barbecue, and thanks for joining in. Because it's afternoon where you are. turn this one off and let it um, and let it just cool and try to be patient to allow it to cool okay so again uh, this started out as brown this one was a uh, dark fawn it is a uh, it is different you see this is darker. 
This one started out as a light fawn. And this one was light fawn, but this is a, a blend, 70% uh, alpaca and 30% merino and soy. That's how you get those various colors. But all the same dye, the same uh, depth of shade, and uh, the same dye technique. What kind of workshops are we offering this year? We're going to be doing dyeing in the studio. We're also working on uh, felting. So I'm going to turn you around for a little bit. Um, we're going to be wet, uh, doing a combination of wet felting and needle felting, I think. So we're just trying to get things in order. And we want to make it um, not too advanced, not too advanced, because most of my visitors are uh, tourists. Um, and, you know, they want an experience. So. Um, course we made some dryer balls. I don't uh, typically make a whole lot of dry balls. I sell a lot of dry balls but I typically don't make them. And then we'll do some needle felting. Uh, or that. Um, Debbie might also did. Now don't laugh because she might be offended. <laughs> um, it's supposed to be sheep. But she did a great job, I thought. This was her first attempt at needle felting. And she got eyes in there, you know, indentions for eyes. The ears are, it's not to scale, but she actually did a pretty good job. And we started with some merino because we thought it was gonna be, be a little bit easier to, to felt the merino than, um, than the alpaca. Um, yeah, and she actually did a little squirrel. Of course, we're going to do, do felt, felted soaps because those are really easy to do for our visitors. Um, so we'll do a combination of that. The other thing that we're doing this year is we're, of course, still offering uh, behind-the-scenes tours, but we're going to be offering a more in-depth animal experience this year. And um, I've had so many people say, hey, can I come volunteer on the farm? You know, I'd really love to come, come volunteer, volunteer on the farm. And... Um, I just don't have the resources to be able to accommodate that. Um, so what we're going to do is one morning a week, we're going to um, offer, become a, an alpaca farmer for the day. <clears throat> it's actually only going to be morning, but uh, so join us starting at nine o'clock in the morning. You spend the morning with us and you do farm chores. So you're going to feed the animals, you're going to clean up after them. Um, whatever herd health has to happen that day, you'll be involved in, whether it's breeding, whether it's halter training, whatever happens to be on the agenda for the day, that's what you're going to experience. So you're really going to, yeah, excuse me. I get a lot of people say who say they'd be really interested in that. So we've got a minimum, minimum of two for that and a maximum of four. We just can't, we can't accommodate more than that and still have, you know, a really interactive hands-on experience. So um, we plan on doing that Friday mornings. So there's only limited spots and there's only limited number of Fridays during the summer. So if you're interested in, in booking that, you should book it now. Yeah, you can book it online. You can book all things online right now. Uh, <clears throat> we haven't uploaded the, um, the needle felting workshop just yet because as I said, we're still kind of working out the, the kinks of that, how that's gonna work. So, let's see how this one's doing, because I still have the temperature, or the heat on this. That's how much dye is left. There's still some dye in there. Uh, the temperature's sitting at 192 here. You can see there's not very much left in there, but I have turned the heat off on this. Um, I think I'll turn the heat off here. And just let it cool and try to be patient. Um, so, hello, teaching take two. So the other thing that I thought I would do, uh, for those of you who don't know how to do it, or don't know what I'm talking about, is I'll show you how to do um, butterfly ties. So while we're waiting for that, give me a second. Okay, I think you're still with me. Let's come over here. Woo! I don't know if you can see. What can you see? Yeah, I think you can see. Woo! Moving all over the place. 
Hold on, I'm gonna lower you a little bit so you can see. There we go. Okay, I think you can see. So um, this is a Yarn Swift. Uh, I don't know how sturdy it is here. I couldn't get it really sturdy on this one. Um, I had it up over here earlier. Um, but I think it's sturdy enough to give you the impression or give you an understanding of what it is we're going to do. So before you put uh, yarn in a uh, tapri soak or in a dye bath, you need to take it from looking like this. Um, to looking like this with some ties. So if you put this in water now or in dye bath, you're gonna have a mess. And you're also gonna have a line right here um, because this is where the yarn, yarn is tied together. Each end is tied, tied together to kind of keep it in a loop. Um, if you put it in the dye bath like this, you're gonna get a lighter color of dye underneath here because it acts as a resist. So, and one, one spot only of holding in the loop is not going to be enough, especially if you're doing a lot of agitation in, in your dye pot. So hopefully this is going to work for me. So we're going to put some uh, butterfly ties in. And I just use, uh, you can use any tie really. Somebody else on here said they used uh, plastic zip ties. I actually bought one of these things. It's huge, <laughs> and I just cut, um, it is a fingering weight yarn. Um, I cut, you know, eight to 10 inches off. So I've got a whole pile of these that I pre-cut. Anyway, we're gonna take this and put it on the Swift, as long as the Swift will stay here for me. Uh, it's just it's just easier. In the, um, when I'm in the house, I put it around a chair. Uh, just makes it easier to work with. Hold on. Stay there, Swift. I'm just going to tighten this. There you go. Uh, it's just a little bit easier to work with. Can you guys see that okay? No, the butter, exactly. The butterfly tie will stay white because this is cotton. And I want it to stay white because I want to be able to find it easily. Yeah, so because this is protein fiber and animal fiber, mm -hmm. and this is a plant fiber. So uh, what I'm going to do first off, once I find it, is um, this was the tie on the yarn. Can you see that? I need to undo that because I don't want to resist. So I've just un untied it, and you've got one piece that's going this way and one piece that's coming this way. So I just take the end and I take one of my ties and I tie it. And I might pull it a little bit snug. And then to do a butterfly tie, stay there. So I'm gonna separate. Um, do I blend any of my fiber with nylon? No, I don't. No, I don't. So I'm going to uh, separate the skein into two bits and I'm going to make a figure eight with my butterfly tie. and then tie the two ends together. Um, no, I don't, I, I don't blend any of my fiber with nylon. Um, presumably, you're asking um, about sock yarn. So I only use natural fibers. So here we have the butterfly tie. It's, it's tied in a figure eight format. So now we've got each half of that yarn is secure. So now we need to take the other end of that uh, that was previously tied and do the same thing. Tie that there. Now sometimes the cotton can be a little bit slippery, so you might have to snug it up a little bit. And it doesn't really matter how much some people will do this three times some people do it two times in terms of you know the number of figure eights I typically do two that seems to work for me um, and I just want to make sure there's a whole lot of room for that yarn to move around within the loop so there's no resist okay let's go 
this way. And then come off. It's getting warm in here. So now, I've got this butterfly tie. So I can pick this up and this, this is in a skein and I can find the center of it if I need to. Um, there we go, oops. And it keeps it from getting all messed up. Although it can look messed up right now. Okay, so there we go. Uh, and then from there I take, whew, it's getting hot in here. I take my um, shower curtain hook, my plastic shower curtain hook. I really like these. Um, and just do that. So I would not recommend you use 100% alpaca wool to make socks. I don't, not that you intend to wear. Hello, knit pickers. Not that you, not socks that you intend to wear um, in boots anyway. So 100% uh, alpaca yarn is great for, um, you know, uh, hats and shawls and sweaters and scarves and things like that, but not socks. You do need um, a more durable fiber if you're gonna use socks. So I wouldn't, but I wouldn't use nylon. I might use mohair, because um, mohair is quite a nice, quite a nice strong fiber and it's a natural fiber. Um, the alpaca socks I sell in the shop um, while I don't make uh, sock yarn, I do sell socks, and the socks that I sell do have synthetic fiber in them. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a sock yarn with a synthetic fiber. I would use probably use um, mohair. Yeah, it's getting hot in here. Oh, it's hot in here. Hello. So there, this is ready to go. It's all secured. All you have to do is pick up either the, um, the curtain curtain hook or either one of these ties. Uh, your yarn's not gonna get uh, too messed up in the dye pot. I mean, often I take it out of the dye pot and it does take a little bit of maneuvering to get it back like this, um, but you can get it back like this, which is why you put the, the ties in. So let's see how we're doing over here. Ooh. Ooh. Bloody hell, it's hot. So there's a fair, there's a fair amount of um, coloring that seems to be sitting on the inside of this. But here, look. So there's very little color that's left in there. There's a little bit more color that's in here. Um, so. For those of you who are still here from when I started, um, this is the first time that I'm using the, the low profile um, restaurant tray, if you will, to do a full immersion dye. So typically I would use a big pot like this, but as I mentioned, I'm struggling to get the heat where I want it because I'm not using a stove, I'm using induction burners. Um, and of course, for immersion heating, if you've got a narrow pot, you need pretty high um, water level and it takes, it takes too long to get it to that level. Uh, whereas with this here, um, I've only got four inches of, of uh, fluid in there, but it's spread out, but it seemed to work out, work out really well. Uh, let's just take a look at this. So this is the lighter color fawn. <laughs> Now let's get the darker color fawn so you can see. And can you see those two okay? Um, so the lighter color fawn and the darker color fawn. And these aren't hot, which is why I love them. I really love them. So we'll try to let them cool a little bit more. Pick you up here. Hold on, hold on. Where'd you go? Ooh, up. <sighs> Whew. It is hot. I think I'm going to take this off because I'm kind of warm in here. Thank you very much for the hearts. The love. Oh. Anyway. So as mentioned, uh, I'm using Jacquard. No, I'm not using Jacquard. I'm using Greener Shades dye in this particular uh, 
bath. I had pre-made my stock solution. I had pre-soaked my yarn just in room temperature water. Um, you need to soak alpaca yarn uh, longer than you need to soak some other yarns uh, if you're using that in your technique. Um, I only soaked mine for about 45 minutes. I could have gone a little bit longer. It takes a long time for alpaca fiber to actually um, get completely wet and to soak up. So um, then I added my, I determined what um, depth of shade I wanted because I have a formula that I use for this particular colorway. Uh, I added my dye to the each pot and then I added my citric acid and I warmed the dye bath to my preferred temperature before I actually added my yarn. So uh, the temperature of the dye bath ranged between probably 180 and just over 200. That would be Fahrenheit. Yeah. And uh, about 15 minutes in, I added a little bit more citric acid because I wanted the, um, the yarn to take up the rest of that dye a little bit quicker. And now I've turned both pots off and I'm allowing them to cool. There is a little bit of color still left in both dye baths, but if I'm patient and I let these cool completely, that yarn will take out the remaining dye. Yeah, so that's what I did this morning. So I do have these online. So uh, while these in the dye pot are fingering weight yarn, they're my um, uh, lady slipper. Uh, so if you go to my website, you can order um, eggplant will be the darker fawn and um, orchid will be the lighter fawn. Uh, these ones here are in the same colorway, but they're worsted weights. And this is um, this is my royal birch line. So again, it's eggplant in royal birch. This one here is Keating and Crew, and this one is Kez and Sons. So uh, they're both online. And uh, this one, oh, this one is too. Um, this is a uh, lopy weight yarn and as I mentioned this isn't hundred percent alpaca this is 70% alpaca and 30% merino soy uh, and it's a lopy like or lopy weight yarn and this is Maggie and Quinn in very berry this is beautiful it turned out really well hello hello nice to see you so let me just reskin this because it's coming apart Thank you. So, how's it going there, Margaret? So we will be doing uh, workshops this year in the dye studio. You can book a workshop and come dye some yarn yourself. So whether you want to do an immersion dye or you want to do, oh, I should go get those other ones. Um, do uh, some other techniques, that's what we'll do. We're gonna do that Wednesday mornings in the studio. Come with me. Let me go get the other one. So you can see. Uh, da, da, da. So I'll get a variety of them. Whoops. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a speckled. Okay, I got some. Sorry, you got an extreme close up of me. Maybe you didn't want that. <laughs> Oops. That'd be awesome. Okay, so this one I called pansies. What do you think of this one? And this is uh, a DK weight yarn. This is Melpec Ebb in pansies. Uh, this one doesn't have a name yet. I haven't decided on this one, but this is also a DK weight. Do I sell all of my yarns in bare form? No, some of them I, some of them I do. I've only got... Uh, I have some ivory in my 8020 blend alpaca merino. Uh, I do have some oatmeal that's Leo and, and Jordy. Uh, that's also a worst of weight, and that is uh, a 702010 blend of alpaca merino and bamboo. Uh, I've got lots of fawn. I've got Keswick and no, I have Bella the Ball, which is fawn. I have uh, Griff and Friends, which is a great. Oh, I got to show you that. Hold on, hold on. Don't go anywhere. I got to show you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, 
because I did an experiment uh, a couple weeks ago. Bear with me. I'm taking yarn from all over the place here. Okay, I got it. I got it for you. Again, extreme close up. I'm going to put these over here. Hey guys. So, uh, hold on a sec. Okay. So, I took these. Where's my gray? Maggie, can you grab me a gray? Is everything okay on the side? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, the dark gray from top. No, no. Still in this area, but the second one from the top. This one? Yep. Please. Thank you. So I took these, these, this, and this. So these are all my bears right now. So this is uh, Forest Foxley, Allie, and Lily. Um, this is, uh, I call it oatmeal. It's a really, really light fawn. Uh, this is Leo and Jordy. Uh, this is Bella the Ball. Um, this is Emperor Magnolia and Majestic. And this is Griffin and Friends. So I took these and I over them. All together. And this is what I got. This turned into this. I love this. Um, which one's this? This one turned into this. This one, Bell of the Ball, turned into this. And then these two, these two turned into this. Oops, turning around. <laughs> there. Yeah. So uh, I really love how this gray um, over dyed because this gray and this gray actually, both these grays are, are quite variegated to begin with. Um, they're not, they're not a flat color. So, um, there's lots of flex, lots of white in here, and I really love how, how the darker gray over dyed. So I don't have a name for this color. I only did one skein of each, but I took notes. <laughs> so yeah, we can do that. Um, not exactly a speckle technique, but speckle light. So this one is confetti. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this one here. I did this in um, in a mango and gray and white before, and I called it uh, Great Blue Heron. So um, the technique I used for this was uh, I had pre-soaked the yarn, of course, and I put some of the yarn in the dye bath, and I only allowed part of, part of the yarn to take up the dye, and then uh, I allowed that to exhaust, and then I put different dye in, and then did something else. So yeah, no shortage of ideas, techniques, do you have dark green, like, ooh, dark green bottle? Yeah. I have a couple really dark greens. Um, now all of my yarn is all of a sudden gonna be over there. Not, why don't I just turn you around here? I don't have them. Um, so this one here, I don't have the light. So this one I called forest. You could, uh, let me see if I can get you a little bit closer to the light. Um, there is lots of variegation in this one. This is beautiful. And it's not showing, it's showing up pretty cool on the camera, but it's actually a pretty warm color. And then this one, ooh, I call Sacramento. Bear with me. Uh, and again, this is showing up really cool on camera. Um, it, is, it is warmer in real life. Let's see if the, the light in the other section. Uh, what that looks like. Let's see it under, under this light. Oh, I'm going to turn you around. So you see me. <laughs> I don't have enough arms. <laughs> so that's a little bit better. That's showing up a little bit more realistic. So that's the Sacramento. And this is forest. Oops. Again, you can see there's quite a lot of variegation in there. Is that what you is that what you were meaning? Yeah. And these together. Beautiful. Beautiful.
Anyway, it's just 11.36 now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's just 11.36. Uh, I am going to post this. Um, I'm going to stop the live shortly. Um, and I will post it. Look at that. Just about gone. Sacramento. Yeah, I really like that. Um, it's, very, it's a very deep color. But it's not flat. Um, I really like the, um, the tone. It's, it's quite tonal. So these are all online. You can find them all online. <coughs> anyway. And you love, Melanie loves the confetti. Yep. So uh, I didn't, as I said, I didn't use sprinkle for this. Um, I use liquid rather than dry powder to do this. Um, yeah. Anyway. It's time for me to sign off. Because uh, I got students here looking for some direction for me. Um, I want to thank you very much for joining me this morning. It was fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, uh, if you don't already follow, hello, Isabel. If you don't already follow, please give me a follow, uh, a like, a share, a subscribe, whatever, whatever. I I would really appreciate it. Um, you can find us online at greengablealpacas.com. Um, all of the yarns I showed you today are online. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're interested in coming for a tour or booking a workshop, you can do that online as well. So uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. In a salt shaker. Well, that's really interesting. I'm going to keep that in mind. I'm going to keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Anyway, have a wonderful afternoon. Perhaps I'll do that next time. Have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Bye. Enjoy the rest of your day, too. Cheers. <laughs>